Hi, this is Dr. Max Fung, University of California, Davis in Sacramento, California. This is the annual introduction and orientation for our year-long teaching curriculum in dermatopathology. For our dermatology and pathology residents and fellows, medical students, and visiting rotators. So, dermatopathology, or some say dermatopathology, or just derm path, it's a relatively subspecialized area in medicine that is dedicated to the evaluation and management of skin disease via the microscopic and increasingly submicroscopic evaluation of lesional skin tissue. And it's a fund of knowledge that was created jointly through the efforts of pathologists and dermatologists about a century and a half ago. And so in order to, to do an authentic history dive, one needs to be able to understand some European language, but the likes of uh, Curly, Pincus, father and son, and also Paul Una figured largely in the original foundations of the clinical and then subsequent histopathologic features of skin diseases. And I particularly remember Paul Una because I've got a photograph of him in my office that, that sits just above the, um, uh, the Go Kings sample of their old basketball arena, basketball court. But in any case, Paul Una was considered one of the premier dermatologists of the early 20th century. And he has one of, he described one of the different types of melanocytic nevi as well as seborrheic dermatitis. My own experience with dermatology uh, in the English language can be traced to the uh, textbooks of dermatopathology by Walter Lever, who wrote the first edition. I think this is the original in my limited knowledge as a dermatology history dilettante, emphasis on dilettante, the original comprehensive US-based dermatopathology textbook written by Dr. Lever when he was a fifth year dermatology junior faculty at Harvard in 1949. And I believe Lever's dermatopathology remains the most comprehensive US-based dermatopathology textbook now in its 12th edition. And at this juncture, I feel compelled to mention a scholarly point of pride, if not conflict, not financial, unfortunately, a scholarly point of pride in that I co-authored one of the chapters in Lever. And in the framed photograph, Dr. Lever is standing in the center when he visited in 1977 as UC Davis Dermatology's Novi Visiting Scholar. Standing to Dr. Lever's right is Dr. Lawrence Bass, Larry Bass, the UC Davis Dermatology founding chairman. I'll talk about tissue staining and special stains in a separate lecture, but suffice it to say here that the accidental discovery of hematoxylin in the 1800s, followed by the creation of eosin, and soon after the discovery of the utility of the H&E double stain, hematoxylin and eosin, has really stood the test of time, R really a vast understatement, like a century and a half and, and going strong. And I think its longevity is attributed to its winning combination of its superior ability to differentiate fine tissue structures and also rapid turnaround and relative cost effectiveness. The 1970s and 80s saw the advent of immunohistochemistry, now an indispensable component of our armamentarium and sometimes absolutely required for the diagnosis of certain tumors. And then, of course, since the 1990s, the advent of molecular diagnostics, also now indispensable for a relatively small set of tumors. Skin specimens are obtained and submitted by a wide variety of healthcare providers, but the single biggest source, of course, is the dermatologist's office. This is an example of a quite a large waiting room. This is Peking Union Medical College that I had the opportunity to visit in 2018. The Dermpath waiting room is quite a bit more compact. And sometimes I tend to rather fancy ourselves as more of like a five-star hotel or a medispa in that our dedicated couriers diligently and carefully and safely transport each specimen from its site of origin and delivers them to their appointment in the Dermpath waiting room. One by one, each specimen is accessioned, grossed, processed, 
embedded, cut, stained, cover slip, labeled, and magically slides appear in trays on our desks. And we subsequently, subsequently then view these alongside trainees in many cases and then issue a diagnosis in the form of a pathology report. So in rendering a diagnosis on case after case after case, pathologists wield great responsibility and power. And that is part of the course in traditional surgical or anatomic pathology, AP, where histology is the diagnostic gold standard for most tumors, including skin tumors. Clinical correlation is still essential. And of course, with any technique, there are limitations. So some cases are simply challenging and beyond the range of what h and &E can resolve. Alternatively, if one is perhaps asleep at the wheel for even just one case, there's a potential to make an error that could potentially result in patient harm. Sometimes a technical error could be quite significant, a wrong or a switched specimen. And then finally, we mentioned ancillary diagnostic te testing, which can be decisive in certain cases, but typically the decision to test has to be recognized as being indicated based on the H and E. The other side of dermatopathology are the skin rashes or inflammatory skin disorders, in which the gold standard for diagnosis is not just the pathologic diagnosis, but rather a clinical path correlation. So one must know one's clinical derm. And molecular studies are playing an increasingly prominent role in the entire field of pathology. It's been said that such studies may even replace h &E entirely within the next few decades. This being a quote and also a, a photographic tribute to the first person who taught me dermatopathology as a second year medical student and then later as a dermatology resident, Dr. Phil Lebois, founder of UC San Francisco Dermatopathology Service. And so for now, I'll leave you with this image for thought, if you will. Is this just a, an aging dermatopathologist bad dream? and the end of dermatopathology as we currently know it, or perhaps somebody else's opportunity for a Nobel Prize. Probably both. However, at present, I do not really see any impending end to the current way of doing things, which is that the vast majority of our diagnoses are in fact made definitively on hematoxylin and eosin, H and E stain sections alone, with occasional but critical assistance from histochemical and or immunohistochemical stains. Although DermPath and H&E have been around for well over a century, the subspecialty is still relatively small in terms of full-time practicing dermatopathologists. UC Davis Medical School was founded in 1966, and it was not until 86 that Dr. Ronald Barr was recruited as chair of dermatology with a primary focus in derm path. Joining him was the late Dr. Philip Vogt, who stayed here for the rest of his career. After that, we had the amazing Dr. Beth Rubin. I arrived in 2002 and started the derm path service as we know it today, and of the seven full-time dermatopathologists at UC Davis. Three of them are still your attendings, myself, Dr. Thomas Konia, and Dr. Maya Kiyuru. We also have an affiliation with the Veterans Affairs Hospital where we have Dr. Joshua Schulman, an amazing teacher. We also have volunteer teaching from dermatopathologists in private practice at Diagnostic Pathology Medical Group. And there are many dermatopathologists who are board certified, but not primarily focused on DermPath. One of those is Dr. Peter Lynch, former department chair and distinguished Novi professor and program director. And Dr. Lynch was the one who kindly donated some of his older dermatopathology textbooks to me when he retired. The UC Davis Dermatopathology Service is a CLIA certified and CAP College of American Pathologists accredited laboratory within the Department of Dermatology, located a few miles from the main UC Davis Hospital and Medical Center, Center at the site of an old cannery, now Cannery Business Park, or the park in East Sacramento. Across the street is the Roxy Delicatessen, 
which was featured in the 2017 film Lady Bird. And right across the street from the Roxy Deli is the dermatology department, including Suite 1450, the dermatopathology service, where you will inevitably encounter one or more of the smiling faces and helpful individuals in our unit. And of course, our in-person teaching activities were significantly impacted during the COVID-19 pandemic. But I'm happy to say that as of early summer in 2023, things are returning back to a, if I could say a new and improved world, the best of both worlds, if you will. Although it still may be prudent at times, we're no longer really obsessed with distancing and wiping down the equipment after every use. And just like everybody else in the world, I hope that the next pandemic never comes. But while I have it in the presentation, I'll highlight the surprisingly high number of touch points involved in using a microscope. Our DermPath service uses two different lab reporting systems. For UC Davis cases, we have the Beaker lab reporting system, which is part of the EPIC uh, EHR. Uh, and then uh, for outside cases that come from outside UC Davis, we have a separate system supported by NovoPath. Now for these two laboratory reporting systems that run in parallel, trainees will essentially only be using the first system, which is the Beaker lab reporting system that is electronically interfaced with the EPIC electronic medical records. And so all specimens submitted by UC Davis providers will be in this system and use an ex a DC accessioning wheel in contrast to the SP accessioning wheel for cases that originate in the hospital pathology laboratory. And for cases submitted by providers outside UC Davis, we use the NovoPath system with a DS accessioning system. I feel very blessed that I've worked consistently with very conscientious and responsible colleagues and trainees. The one housekeeping thing to remember is that these little one by three inch glass slides are easy to move around, but just remember that they're part of the patient's medical record. And unlike the electronic records, they are essentially irreplaceable. So if you do need to take slides out of the DermPath unit for whatever reason, please just check in with our admin staff and they can prepare a tissue release form for you. All of the recent slides from the past several years are filed on site. And so you could retrieve those yourself or ask one of our very capable admin staff to retrieve those slides for you with a little bit of advance notice. And when you're finished with the slides, you don't need to refile them. Just go ahead and put them in this shelf around the corner from the main admin desk. And it is a point of great personal pride that I can speak with total confidence that every one of our admins individually takes great pride in their expertise and professionalism and their ability to support patients and their providers. It's also totally obvious and self-evident to me that we absolutely could not do what we do or what we have done without the leadership from our laboratory manager, Daniel Gong, and laboratory supervisor, Aubrey Gasper each kind of leading their individual teams and recognizing one employee each year at our annual staff appreciation event. Biopsies obtained from critically ill patients are marked for top priority. And it never hurts that if you write or mark on the comment section of the order that it's a rush or hospital case, but our laboratory staff is well-trained to recognize those specimens and we will automatically prioritize those. Now, if you happen to be in the lab, if you are able to kind of just give the staff a verbal heads up as you're dropping the specimen off in the bin, that never hurts. And if you're off site and need to contact the lab, you can always call the main number or get the back line for the laboratory uh, from the orientation handout and call the lab directly to, to make sure that someone's going to be there. For example, if it's getting close to 5 p.m. on a weekday. And for number three here, I'm gonna emphasize this because you're getting a lot of information overload in July of the first year especially. And once you're on the front lines and it's a critical situation, you're doing hospital biopsies, 
it's late in the afternoon typically when you see those patients and maybe you decide you need to do a biopsy. So one of the things that commonly comes up with the hospital biopsies is, is infection. And of course the patients tend to be critically ill. So one of the options that we have is to pre-order special stains for pathogens or bug stains. And so if you write rule out infection on the order, pretty good chance that our histotechnologists are going to recognize that and contact the pathologist of the day to make a determination if special stains should be obtained. But in the end, it's kind of a case-by-case -case decision. On one hand, sometimes you look at the H&E afterwards and realize that the special stains were never indicated. But on the other hand, if the index of suspicion is correctly high, then we are going to want those special stains to be more definitive about confirming or excluding a pathogen. And of course, this is most critical on a late Thursday or a Friday or before a long holiday weekend. So all those kind of factors have to kind of be considered in the overall composite assessment and the situational awareness. But this is something to keep in mind that we do have the capability of pre-ordering special stains when there's a reasonable chance that it is going to be fruitful. Weekend and evening stat frozen sections are covered, and they're actually covered 24-7 as needed by the Department of Pathology. The pathology residents should have the details in their resident policy and procedure manual. And this uh, introductory lecture, when it was in person, used to be the first chance that you would get to see the people that you'd be working side by side with in the evenings or after hours when you had a, a stat case. Now, sometimes when a stat case happens during normal business hours and DermPath is open, we're happy to handle that stat frozen section as well. Just, just call DermPath and more often than not, we'll be able to take care of that slide preparation. Your welcome packet includes a DermPath grossing manual at the end. And in that, you'll see that the shave, punch, and excision specimens are the most common specimens submitted in DermPath. The shave and the punch biopsies are relatively small specimens that can usually fit in a single cassette on a single slide, whereas the excisions and occasional uh, incisional biopsies are usually submitted in multiple blocks sectioned in red loaf fashion. In the old days when I was a resident, and maybe, maybe still true at other programs, the residents on rotation were expected to gross the specimens. That's no, not the case in our program, but it's still very valuable to understand how specimens are grossed in the lab. So if you have interest in seeing that, just please contact one of your attendings and we'll arrange for you to, to uh, observe one of our grossing technicians. When you're on the derm path rotation, you spend most of your time at the microscope. So sometimes it almost seems like the slides just kind of magically appear there. But in fact, uh, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, not just the grossing, but several steps after that. So this, uh, this text here is just a little bit of a snippet from the uh, grossing manual that's been provided to you and it just attests to the fact that there's a critical importance of accuracy at every step along the way specimen after specimen after specimen we have a team of highly skilled technicians working sometimes it seems non-stop behind the scenes to get these slides to us promptly and accurately hats off to them more snippets from the grossing manual that I won't dwell on since you have it. Although I have to say, looking at this, that I do, I do see some of the words of wisdom from Dr. Philip Lebois from UCSF. He gave me a, a similar grossing handout when I was a, a dermatology resident there. Punch biopsies may be in a wide range of diameters. Probably four millimeter is the most common, but as you can see, there's a wide range. Whenever possible, we do prefer to bisect the specimens so that we don't lose any tissue and that the initial sections will be from the center of the specimen most likely representative. Grossing guidelines for shave specimens are similar to the punch biopsies. Shave specimens could be shave removals or shave excisions, uh, in which case we would typically add ink to better assess margin status. The glass slide on the upper right shows bread loaf sections of an excision specimen. You can see the tumor at gross power in the top two pieces of tissue there. And the grossing diagram shows a top view of an excision specimen with the vertical black lines indicating the locations of the bread loaf sections. Typically, we put the excision tips in a block. And as you can see, B and C would be a second and a third block 
of this specimen. If the specimen was submitted with the orientation, such as a suture or a hash mark, then we would use two different colors of ink in order to preserve that orientation in the event of a positive margin. And less commonly received is the incisional biopsy, but it's worth mentioning here. These specimens may be an identical size and shape to an excision specimen, but uh, in this case, the clinician is not looking for margins. It may be a portion of an inflammatory disorder, often a paniculitis or morphia. And so in that case, we don't need red loaf sections. We don't need ink for margins. What we want is really just the best tissue sections that we can get. So these would actually be section longitudinally so that we get uh, single large tissue specimens as opposed to multiple red loaf sections. Makes for pretty viewing and nice photomicrographs in the event of publication. Let's start to conclude with a few comments on your learning. Of course, you'll be continuously training through the DermPath curriculum through your residency time here, uh, but let's start with some of the resources that are available and hopefully to you as digital natives, um, you won't find the, the potential for information overload here quite as whelming as, as a digital immigrant like me would. But there's no shortage of dermatology, pathology, and derm path textbooks. Uh, some of the ones listed here are, are just scratching the surface. Uh, increasingly, as you can see here, some of these resources are online, and pretty much all of these textbooks generally nowadays have online versions for you to study from. And as I alluded to before, unfortunately, I do not have any financial conflicts of interest with any of these. Uh, I, I did write a few chapters in some of these books, but, but um, that's the extent of it. And currently, our program is providing the Elston and Faringer textbook here, this one right here. And so that's what the dermatology residents are starting with. But I find that many trainees over time then expand to other textbooks, depending on your level of interest. If you find yourself wanting to learn more about DermPath, maybe even thinking about a possible fellowship application, it's a good idea to stay on the cutting edge of the field by reading the journals and participating in the DermPath societies. The two largest journals are the Journal of Cutaneous Pathology and American Journal of Dermatopathology. And both journals are sponsored by societies who also hold national and international meetings in dermatopathology. Uh, unfortunately, the upcoming ASDP meeting was converted to virtual. So we'll see how that goes. This is new and uncharted territory. Um, the live meetings for ISDP in 2021 are still a go pending further developments. We have a hard copies of both of these journals in the teaching room in our DermPath unit, and both are available through the UC Davis Library as well. I think I've had some version of this slide in my introductory lecture probably for at least a decade. Uh, but I like to put this up at the beginning of the year uh, because we have incoming trainees and also trainees who are graduating to the next postgraduate year. And I think it's uh, as a, an appropriate time as any to think about yourself, think about your training, your goals, your aspirations, and see how that might fit, whether that be derm path or some er other area of dermatology or medicine. Um, but, but here's some details of what could be construed as a hierarchy of competence in dermatopathology. And of course, I put a question mark there because there's not a whole lot about this that needs to be rigid. Uh, one could say very little about this or discuss it for hours. So that, that will happen in the Zoom session afterwards. But at a minimum, as a dermatology or pathology resident, you are expected to pass the dermatology or AP boards. And as you surely know, the derm path component exists in both. So, so that's the minimum. Everything else is extra on your own, but there's lots of different things that can be done. Uh, if you can complete a fellowship, then it opens up other opportunities. Uh, these are things that we can discuss individually or as a group in the Zoom meeting. Here's the third scenario for discussion. And a fourth scenario. Here's the second one. And as we segue to the virtual discussion, I'm going to leave you with four scenarios to think about and discuss with me. Uh, I won't read them. You can look at them as fast or as slow as you want. Uh, but here's the first one. And finally, the last and perhaps most philosophical one. So I hope you found some useful information and resources from this introduction. 
your Derm Path attendings here are very passionate about telling, showing, and involving you in the wide, wide world of Derm Path. And we know that you'll forget some things, but also that you're going to remember and learn.